profit. Take it away, Jerome. <laughs> ah, okay. Uh, hello, everybody um, who took the time and the effort and the energy to be here at this hour. And um, uh, probably you made it late last night. Maybe there's some alcohol involved. You never know. Um, I'll try to be, make this a, a, a I try to make this a happy thing. Okay. Um, the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to present you with a choice. Um, there's this choice. I can do either a very boring standard introduction of who I am, or I can do a pretty, well, it's a high impact kind of introduction of who I am. So show of hands, who wants the polite, you know, you're just awake, relax kind of introduction. Or who wants the, <laughs> even one, great. Um, and who wants the high impact, you know, the full circle, and oh my God, what am I getting into? That one, okay. Uh, why do people choose that one? I never understand that. Okay, but you'll get it. Um, oh, I have to go to the other screen. Oh, back, yeah, and then click here, yes. Okay, so who am I? Um, I'm the father of five. Uh, these are the five. Uh, please notice there's one girl in a wheelchair. I, I was going to talk about that a little bit more, uh, but there's also one that I'm holding who is um, uh, mentally very challenged. Uh, I used to be a firefighter for 10 years, so I love to um, uh, work on cars after a car crash. Uh, hopefully without many uh, severe injuries. Um, here I'm saving a dog who was swimming, which is normally pretty healthy, but not in the middle of the winter when there's a hole in the middle of the ice and he can't get out and he gets hypothermia and at some point he would drown, but he, we, did, we saved him, so yay, everybody's all right. Uh, this is my helmet and the front part of it, the black part in the middle is melted. Uh, so it was a little hot, but it was an exercise and actually it was pretty fun. Uh, not for my uh, chief, because he had to replace that and he had a budget and he didn't like that, but I did. Um, I do stuff with scouting, um, so I even combine firefighting with uh, the boy scouting. We are now, as you know, probably on the Dutch scouting grounds, um, so the large event fields. Um, and uh, I, there is uh, some events, some larger events, same size as, as MCH actually, with a lot of scouts from all over the world, love to do that. Um, I wrote a couple of books, I'm now currently busy with my 14th book, I believe, I don't know why, uh, I must be pretty insane somewhere. Uh, these are three of the type, some type of topics are in English, some are in, 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 in Dutch. Uh, and I'm a caretaker, of course, so uh, there we go. Uh, and it also shows with all this photo, the balance in your life that you try to do things, but there are also other things more important. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, by the way, I also manage an open source project called LibrePlan, who does open source project management uh, uh, planning software. Pretty cool. And uh, up there is the logo. I don't know if you can see it, but it, it's there. Um, so and this is the boring slide because I couldn't jump over it. Um, so it's the same. Uh, I, uh, I try to solve IT problems, and the rest I already told you. So, this is the boring slide. So, what do you think? Should I next time do again this choice, or should I skip it and go just to the boring slide, which is pretty standard for everybody who does a talk? Who is in favor of keeping the boring slide and do the all? Oh, okay, and who is in favor of the, you know, the high impact, you, you, you get to learn me a little bit? Okay, oh, okay, thank you so much. Um, okay, uh, what do I do? Uh, open source consultancy, teaching, training, retraining. I love to retrain people from whatever they did to into IT. Love to do that. Um, okay, uh, Libre Plan. This is a screenshot of Libre Plan. Let's skip that and go. Oh, yeah. Um, who here is not Dutch? A lot of people. Great. Um, so then this is important. Um, 
the Dutch on average speak pretty well English, but we're not English. Um, and uh, this is a very nice Anglo-Dutch translation guide where if a British guy would say, with all due respect, I would hear, oh, he's listening to me, he's respecting me, we've got a nice dialogue going on. Well, it actually he thinks, oh, I think you're wrong. You know, so the, those intricacies, those subtle nuances, not with the Dutch. You know, we're blunt and we speak English and that's it. Deal with it, basically, sorry. Um, okay, let's go to the topic. What's a mainframe? A mainframe is a piece of hardware that's um, sole purpose, its sole design is massive parallel um, uh, in hardware, massive parallelization in hardware. So every thing that happens in a computer has its own piece of hardware. So yeah, there is a CPU, but the CPU is only used to do what the CPU does best, which is a little bit of calculation. It's not a supercomputer. A supercomputer is, is one or a bunch of computers who try to calculate some very complex um, uh, calculation in the shortest possible time. A mainframe is all about throughput getting as much data as possible from A to B in as little time as possible. So how did they do that? In mainframe, they design a piece of hardware to, to offload everything from the CPU. So uh, networking is a separate component. Um, uh, uh, storage is a separate component. Everything is separated from the CPU. So the CPU does one thing, and that's calculate your daily interest on your bank account every night. And that for, I don't know, a gazillion people. Um, so that's the mainframe. We're done, right? Oh, no, sorry. Um, uh, oh, yeah, I'm going to talk about Hercules. Hercules is an open source project, and it's an IBM mainframe emulator. So it's like virtualization, you know, the, the virtual box, the KVMs, the VMwares of this world, we all know them. Some of them we even love. Hercules is the same. It, this, in the software, it emulates the hardware. So you can't do a hardware virtualization because you have an Intel processor in your laptop and not a mainframe CPU. So you do everything in software, which makes it very, very slowly. Um, but there's also good news. Um, and I'll come to that later. Uh, it runs on Linux, Windows, Solaris, FreeBSD, and macOS. Um, what does it look like? Well, on the left, you have the original panel of a mainframe system on the right you have this time is uh, I found it online uh, a window screenshot of Hercules which also has this ve very weird turning knobs at the top that I know nothing about oh yeah I forgot to tell you I, I love to do talks I do a lot of talks about subjects and this subject I know almost nothing about and the almost part is what I'm going to tell you today so if there's anybody here with mainframe experience, you know way more than I do. Um, but if you've never worked with a mainframe, I know more than you. <laughs> OK, um, so what does it do? Well, it runs software, duh. Um, there are many OSs in public domain. Uh, if you have a license and the IBM hardware, you can run several IBM OSs on Hercules. But if you don't have the hardware, most of us don't, then you can only run the open source variations. And a lot of these OSs were developed in the 50s, 60s, and 70s of last century. And they were even open source because they were paid by a grant from the United States uh, government uh, with the, the mandatory clause that, the clause that it had to be open source licensed. So uh, that worked until 1972. Uh, so you can run software from 1972, completely open source, completely legal, on Hercules, and still have a fun time. And that's what we're going to show you today. Um, so what can you run? You can run OS 360, DOS 360, DOS VS, um, MVS, and MVS is the one we're going to focus on today because it's the easiest and uh, the, it's the most active. Uh, but if you're really into bizarre things, the other ones you can also download. There are web pages describing how you should install them in Hercules with very arcane commands. And um, you can really dive into that if, you, if you're into that. Uh, and you can even run Linux, of course, in Hercules. 
Um, well, when I started to look into Hercules, I knew nothing about mainframes. Well, they were big, expensive boxes. That's basically it. Um, and um, I, I googled Hercules. I read about it somewhere, I don't know. And I found the original site of the Hercules project. And it was last updated 12 years ago, which is not really very active, you would think. Uh, currently, it's down, so you can't go there anymore. And the last snapshot on archive.org was from May this year, so it's recently gone down. Um, I followed the site to a certain uh, Mr. Maynard, last modified even way before that, 2004. Um, there was a mailing, uh, mailing list with 7,000 members on Yahoo groups. That list is gone by now. So uh, all 7,000 people, well, had to go somewhere else. Um, and I read about an easy start thing, the Volkers MVS 3.8J Turnkey System version 3. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. It's a long title, but it's very easy, really very easy. Um, second time I did this talk in Sheffield, people in the audience immediately downloaded uh, the software and started playing with it while I was doing the talk. It was that easy. Um, anyway, long time project leader, Jay Maynard. And all in all, if you look around, um, lights are on, but there's nobody home. Uh, you could mail him, no response. Turns out he ran the proje project for a long time and at some point got bored and, and stopped. And then actually stopped. No transference of authority, no, simply stop. Everything went to death null, that's it. Um, and um, uh, a long time ago, I, I even thought he was deceased, you know, it happens. But um, at some point he, um, he, uh, he, he came online and said, well, he ain't dead. That's good news, I guess. Uh, may not be involved in Hercules anymore, but they haven't gone anywhere. He's into other projects now. So what should you do if this interests you? Um, well, there's a new main site, hercules-390.eu. That's where, and it's, it started with a copy of the old site uh, with a couple of updates. And uh, it's, it still doesn't look very fancy, but it's now the, the go-to place for this project. Um, there's a new mailing list uh, on uh, Google Groups. Um, well, they lost about 90% uh, uh, of audience, but uh, there's still 700-ish uh, members. And there's still this easy start, but now there's been an upgrade and MVS 3.j turnkey 4 dash system by Jürgen Winkelmann is the latest incarnation of, uh, of MVS or for Hercules. Uh, this is the site. This is where you can download a zip file. And it, it's got everything. It's got Hercules for Linux, Windows, Mac. Uh, it's got MVS, uh, hard disk images. So you just unzip the zip file, start a command, and you've got a mainframe up and running on your laptop. It's that easy. What it looks like, still 50 minutes left. Oh, man, I just started. Oh, my God. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. Uh, you can learn by uh, lot of, lots of videos on, uh, on YouTube about this. Um, uh, what you need? Well, PC, of course. Raspberry Pi works too, because there's a port of Hercules to ARM. Um, and the mainframe communicates with terminals through a protocol that's called 3270. That's the communication protocol. So you need to have a 3270 emulator to connect to a mainframe. But that's easy because in your, uh, if you use Linux, you have uh, X3270 packages ready in your repository. You can install and you can connect to the mainframe. Um, now, this is a very small mainframe, of course, sitting on a, a manual. Oh yeah, this is very important. Uh, even if I got a few minutes left, this is vital. Uh, storage in mainframe means memory, uh, because hard drives came way later. First they had uh, the punching cards and they had a CPU and memory, that's it. So storage is memory. Um, DASD is directly attached storage device, and that's a hard disk, what we call a drive. They use that, uh, still call that a DASD. Uh, TSO is a time sharing option. That's uh, uh, a piece of software in your mainframe OS that makes it multi-user. Oh, you were wrong. Four times. 
Thank you so much. I'm here in a panic, and you're... How much time do I have? Ah, I've got half an hour left. I'm speeding up and... Whoa. We're going to talk about this later, young man. <laughs> okay, anyway, so, um, time-sharing option. If you, don't, if you didn't buy the time-sharing option on your OS, you had a very expensive single-user uh, system. Uh, talk about weird software. Um, the Jazz 2 is a job entry system, release 2, clearly, the um, because the mainframe works with job queues. So you are working in your terminal, uh, you're editing at some point, and it's, uh, it's screen or you're oriented, so you, you send a screen to the system, it, one of the subsystems manages that, and you get a new screen back. Um, so no interactivity, no mouse, simply keyboard work. Um, and at some point you submit your code, and then it comes in a queue, because a mainframe is expensive, and it, it's, it's a workhorse. It needs to do it, give it something to do, you know? It, it does a lot of stuff. Um, so you get in the queue, and at some point you're, you're, it's your turn, and then half a second later, it's done your job, and you get the results presented to you. Um, Kix is the front end to transactional software, so you can create sort of GUIs for transactional systems. Um, oh yeah, and forget the concept about files. We use in mainframe they use data sets, and a data set is something that the, man the system manager makes for you. So you go to a ma uh, go to a sysadmin and you say, "I need a data set for project whatever," and he says, "Okay, how much space? Well, I think five megabytes will probably cover it," and you get a data set of five megabytes, and you open the data set, and in the data set, you will have your files, and your data files, and whatever you have. So that's a very funny way of, a very good way of preventing a system from getting overloaded, unexpected overloaded drives, because hey, you can't go past the boundaries of your data set. And uh, you can also not extend them, I believe, so if you, run out of space, you have to ask for a new data set and transfer everything to the new data set, and after that you can continue. Um, and the catalog is, uh, well, the, the sort of a system list of available software. So the, the catalog contains the, the, the links to the COBOL compiler and the C, GCC. The, yeah, the GCC for, for, for MVS. Um, or whatever programming language you like. Uh, well, what you will see when you log in is this screen. So this is what it, this is what, well, what it looked like. Um, and you log on, and um, yeah, then you get a menu. Uh, a terminal has on uh, 3270 has dedicated keys that you don't have on your keyboard. So there is a, um, a keyboard map that you can open. Uh, it starts if you, it starts with a very small. Um, icon at the top on the left, and when you open it, you get this key map. And a few keys that are important. One of them is enter. That means send my stuff, which also does the enter key. That's the easy part. But you will do stuff wrong. And when you do stuff wrong, on the GUI level, it doesn't hurt the mainframe. He is unaware of it. But it will lock up your terminal. It will, it will show you an X in the bottom right here saying, I don't know what you did, mate, but it doesn't work like that. And you have to reset your terminal, and that's this button. So it's a software kind of terminal reset st thingy. Trust me, you will use that. Um, demo time. Are we up for a small demo? Or are we asleep? Who's asleep? Okay, um, this is going to be funny. I have to switch my screen and, uh, oh, the pressure of time. Uh, where's my mouse? There's my mouse. And now here's my mouse. Talk. Settings. Displays. Display. Uh, mirror. Apply. Keep changes. Yeah, we all see the same now. Um, open up a terminal, and I will start an 
x d2 as this one. It's a little bit small, so I'll try to option font uh, this one, this one, and then 20, 20, 20, 20, where's, where's 20? Yeah, this one. So it's a little bit bigger. It, can you see this? In the middle, I, because I don't know if you can, uh, I'll hope you can see it, okay. Um, this is all we have for today. Uh, so open the key map, it's there. Uh, CD, TK4, I've unzipped the file, of course, it's all in here. Uh, it's got uh, Linux scripts and everything. And I think you can do the same as I can. MVS, that's it. Now, what I'll see now is the console log that's starting up the system, mounting the DASD system, uh, those are the, the, the hard disks. And I can connect from my terminal to localhost. I cannot yet log in. It will take a few uh, seconds. Um, Zip. Always prepare your demo, and I did. I, I, my demo is prepared. Works like a charm every time. Um, the pom -pom 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 -pom. Reset. Yeah, here we are. Herc zero two. And oh yeah, password. See you later. It's not my password, it's in the system. So if you unzip it, you have the same user ID, same password. Okay, message, welcome on the system, message of the day, uh, fortune cookie, and hey, here we are, we've got the menu. I'm actually running MVS 3.aj mainframe OS on my laptop. Well, for fun and profit, I, I don't see a lot of hilarious people, but um, maybe that will come later. I'm still hopeful. Um, it's a menu system. Uh, you have to understand a few function keys. So for one, if I select one, enter, I get another menu. If I want to go back, I press the function key three that we all have on our keyboard. Nothing specific about that. You can also click here, of course, in, in, the, in, the, in the mapped keyboard window, but why would I? Um, if I have too much data, I can use the function key seven and eight to, to uh, page through the output. Um, let's see, let's select three. And um, here I can select a library uh, because a library is sort of a, a collection of data sets. Um, and um, well, data set I already described, you know. Um, okay, let's do four, and um, I'm going to use the sys2 jclib uh, um, library, and uh, I do a search for that, and then I get only this list, and I have to select this library. Uh, sorry, that's the wrong one. I selected it, and I get info. I do F3, I say E of enter, Enter, hey, I'm in, I'm in my data set. I see a bunch of files. And um, I can page through them with uh, F8 is, to, is down, F7 is up. And there is a very nice file that I would like to you to get to know a little bit, and that's the prime COBOL one file. So I press an E, enter, hey, I've got COBOL. Anybody knows COBOL a little bit? Whoever programmed in COBOL? Okay, great. So do you know there's one COBOL joke? There's a new COBOL dialect. It's called polite COBOL, and it means add I to B, giving C, please. That's the joke. You only understand it if you've ever programmed in COBOL. Um, and I see by the response that it's not even funny. Okay, um, anyway, so I can uh, walk through this file. This is all COBOL with all parts. And at some point uh, at the top, the header, and that's this part, d describes what user will submit this job and uh, what class it is. Class is immediate execution is A, and the message class 
is where does this go to? If I press uh, H is, is, is for holding, so it will have a, a, um, a, a, it will output a printer file on the system, but not on a printer. But if you put an, an A or a B there, you have two pre-configured printers in Hercules. Of course, you can add more printers if you like. Um, anyway, uh, Herc 02A, that's what I've been logged in as. So if I press sub or submit, and so it's fancy, I can even shorter, shorten stuff. Um, it will say, okay, I have a job with number 41 submitted to the system. Okay, well, I'm done here, I guess. Uh, I'll go back up. And here, option eight is the out list. And then, way at the bottom, I have my job 41 that was submitted. That's already been executed, of course, because I have a really fancy laptop, at least compared to a mainframe from the 70s, right? Um, and I can select this one. I cannot edit an output file, of course, because it's an output file, but I can select it. And I see here the output of the job I just submitted, which shows me uh, all compiler messages, uh, a dump of the source code, uh, a header, et cetera, et cetera. And at some point, yay, I've got my prime list. And it goes all the way up to 10,000-ish. Now. And it does this all in a remarkably short time of, it's somewhere up here. Ah, execution time, there at the top. Let's see, elapsed time, 0 0.13 seconds, which is pretty good for, for a laptop. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how stuff works. Uh, I can F3, F3 my top menu, I'm going to log out, I'm going to shut down, and it will start a script that will shut down, uh, shut down the system, and I will log off, and it will start to unmount all the drives, and that was my demo. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Now, let's see if I can go back to the presentation in a, in a timely manner. Um, Settings, displays, join, apply, keep the changes. Where's my, pre here's my presentation. Uh, start from the current slide. And yay, that works too. Wow, I'm amazing today. Uh, okay, so what is the performance of a mainframe on my laptop compared to an actual actual mainframe these days. What's what's the speed difference? What factor of speed are we talking about? Well, uh, Hercules performance. Um, we are comparing an i7 processor to a real IBM Z14. And if you know that the Z16 has just been announced, um, it's about this is uh, uh, about three, year, three years old. Z Z14 was about three years ago the main model. Um, so this is on Hercules. So test one does 344 million instructions per second. Oh, okay. And a mainframe does 5.8 billion. So you divide those two, you do it in your mind. I'll give you a few seconds to calculate this. You know, what else have you got to do? Oh, I'll tell you, it's about approximately 16.8 uh, times faster. Of course, this is comparing apples to elephants. Uh, why? Because this laptop is not built for massive throughput, and a mainframe is. So its job is not to calculate prime numbers. Its job on the mainframe is to get as much data from A to B, and it does it way faster than any laptop. Um, and the, the developments currently in mainframe are still state of the art. If you think you have cool hardware, think again. Mainframe hardware is absolutely way more cool. Um, we're all talking about, uh, you know, I've got a system with a three gigahertz processor. 
Oh, that's nice. They have 128 processors at 15, uh, sorry, at 5 gigahertz. You know, there has to be a difference. You pay for it, don't get me wrong. Um, okay, some updates since the first time I did the talk. Moshix, very nice guy, uh, made an online system available, so you mail him. The presentation will, of course, be uploaded to the uh, pre-talks. Um, and you can mail him and you get an account and you can play around with MVS without unzipping a zip file if that's too hard. Well, maybe in this audience it will, you will probably manage. Um, I did a research someday about uh, the mailing group. Uh, how old are you guys? And it turned out um, they were on average 62 years old. So they're getting close to retirement. Do you start to understand the for-profit part of my title? Or maybe I should explain it. I don't know. Um, there, there was this guy, a boy, 18 years old, who did a bid on eBay. $344 was all he had, and he got himself a mainframe from a university. So uh, he has a hilarious YouTube uh, movie uh, clip about how he got all that stuff with his dad's car from the university to home, and, well, he had to sort of rebuild the basement without his parents knowing to get the hardware in, and then switch it on, and the lights were a little bit dimmed, uh, you know, and then working out how that thing worked. He got a job at IBM Pekupsi, and Pekupsi is the place where they develop new uh, mainframe hardware. So he really landed his day jo uh, dream job simply by investing a little bit and, and started to play around with it. And he said, hey, you, you love mainframes. Why don't you come work for us? Oh, by the way, this is not a pitch. I'm not a, a recruiter. Um, I maybe should say that at the start, because every time you're, oh, I'm in IT. Oh, you want to work for us? You know, boring. Uh, OK. Um, so I was thinking, oh, this is fun. And I asked in a group, does anybody have an old original 3270 terminal that I can hook up to my laptop? And some very nice guy from Amsterdam said, yeah, I'll hook you up. I'll have the stuff. That should have got me thinking. I'll have the stuff. Anyway, I went there and he showed me a pile of stuff. All this to get this terminal working on this simple Dell PC. And there's even a component missing because I didn't have it at that time. But this one has a coax cable that goes to a concentrator where the configuration is in five and a quarter floppy drives. Um, that goes to a HDLC modem cable stuff thing that I don't use, but there is an... Uh, an extra um, insert that you can do, an optional insert for either Ethernet or token ring. And Ethernet is very uh, expensive and very rare, so you end up with token ring, which means that you, you'll exit on the back of this with token ring to a token ring hub that you just have to la got laying around, of course, eh, as one does. Um, and then you go to a Cisco router where that does understand token ring and understands Ethernet to get to Ethernet to your uh, PC. Um, so that's all here on the back, all coax uh, uh, connections. And uh, anyway, and that's uh, supposedly works. Which is, yeah, yeah, you said that the first time. No, no, I'm not going to. No, no, I don't get that. Nice joke. Um, and um, now there's this guy, Andrew Kay, and he started thinking about this and playing with it. And he did a reverse engineering of the 3270 protocol because it was not documented outside of IBM. And he started making hardware. And the first hardware he made was, um, was this, yeah, this board where you should go, this is coax in and this USB out, and you have to go to eBay to get pretty rare, and they're not more in production, but you can find them on eBay, two chips, and, and buy them for 15 euros or 15 euros or something. Um, and then um, you can connect that, and it's, it's smaller than this pile of hardware. And, but he was not satisfied because, well, you know, you have to get these old chips and there's no future in old chips. So he started designing again and he made this board. And this is a coax plug 
which means this is a very small board. And he put an FPGA on it, an Arduino controller on it, and then started hacking and coding. And that works. Um, which in, is, 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 I, I totally respect that. That's, to me, that's the, wow, you know? Um, now, if you only want the experience of an old terminal, simply install the cool retro term uh, software package, and you can have an application window that looks like an old monitor. Even if you like with, with, with uh, the, 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 um, the sync problems uh, coming down the screen, if you like. Um, OK, during preparation and giving this talk, I, I met a few new friends, um, a lot of guys in the S390, because if, there's a very helpful bunch of people. If, you're, if you like to learn more about it, join this mailing group, start asking your questions. Uh, they are getting, like I said, near to retirement, and they love young people to, to get uh, younger people <laughs> um, to become interested in, in this. Uh, Moshe Bar of the Moshe YouTube channel is based in Texas. Very nice guy, um, always ready to answer stuff. Uh, Sam Gallup. Well, Sam Gallup is the maintainer of the CBT uh, tape, and that's a distribution of tools. So it's a distro. Basically, it's a maintainer of a distro if you're into Linux. And this is just a computer tape with a lot of tools, and everybody knows the CBT tape, and he downloads them and, and installs tools. In. That's what, um, what he maintains. Uh, we've even got, a, 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 in, in the Netherlands, a, a couple of uh, really nice uh, mainframe guys. Rob Prince makes a, a, an editor, uh, RPF, uh, does also a very nice update on uh, Turnkey uh, 4 that you can do download at his place. Uh, we have a guy from Groningen, I forgot his name, I forgot to put it on here, but he did the free XA initiative. Why? Because MVS at that time had a maximum memory of 16 megabytes. So you can't address more in MVS than 16 megabytes. And he uh, put up a poll and asked for a lot of signatures and then asked IBM, can you please release into the open source, it doesn't have to be uh, the source code, binary is fine as well, the MVS XXA, which was a successor to MVA, MVS, which, uh, w in which you can address two gigabytes of memory, which would be nice. You can do more stuff with it. And I believe that it's got TCP built in. Um, and uh, he got uh, some 1,300 signatures, but IBM uh, declined, unfortunately. So IBM, please don't be a jerk. Give us the stuff, right? Um, Mainframes today, why would you use a mainframe? Well, it's fully encrypted, everything. It's got security, unparalleled transactions per second per computer unit, and amazing mean time between failures. This thing is as stable as a rock. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why people buy mainframes. Um, there's a very nice uh, uh, YouTube clip uh, where he says, I tried to break a million dollar computer. Well, yeah, the price is about right, but it's, it, it shows you the technologies involved in the latest mainframe uh, um, uh, release cycle, the Z16. And what if, because it's got, uh, it starts at 128 cores in a CPU, but every core has also got an AI chip next to it. So it's really for also developing really new, interesting um, uh, functionality. In conclusion, I think it's a wonderful new world, and it's for fun, and could be for profit. Any questions? If uh, anyone does have any questions, can you um, uh, line up behind the microphone so that we can hear loud and clear what the question is? Um, and uh, Signal Angel, do we have any questions from the internet? No questions uh, from the internet at the moment. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> ah, we have a question. Ah, Fantastic. Have Yay. It's kind of a question. Um, sure. I'm ancient. I'm about the, the average age of your. You know, your yeah, me too by now, yeah. <laughs> um, go us. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> But when you, keep, when you say mainframe, are you, are you referring solely to IBM? 
Uh, at the moment, well, I'm not an expert, but at the moment, I it's believe they're the sole supplier of mainframe sure hardware in the world. That could be, because um, when I when when I was a child, I'm pretty sure they weren't the only ones. Yeah, there so. were more, of so course. So it would uh, be handy if you. Yeah. It, it would just be handy if you said that. But um, I really enjoyed the talk. It was great. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Next. Hi. Thanks for the talk. Thank um, you. How similar is uh, the uh, development environment that you showed, the TK4, to uh, an actual current uh, IBM mainframe? Uh, in a way, it's very similar because the GUI is still very much similar. Of course, there are much more features involved these days. Uh, database technology has evolved. Uh, uh, transactional GUI uh, kicks has evolved. Uh, of course, encryption has evolved. Um, uh, they also cross-compile a lot of open source tools uh, to mainframe. Uh, there are uh, some who say, look, uh, we can uh, virtualize everything on a mainframe. So you get one mainframe where you have 30,000 instances of Linux doing web stuff. Yeah, that, that's possible if you've got a system like that laying around. Um, uh, what I also see is a lot of organizations who have a mainframe stay with a mainframe. And one of the reasons is that IBM makes sure that the cost of upgrading a mainframe is less than porting the software to a new platform. Um, uh, so they really make sure that there is a business case where you can only say, oh, let's upgrade the system because it's cheaper than porting everything to a new uh, platform. Um, I'm also an as 400 fan. I've got a collection of about seven of those devices. And it's, it's a mid-range. It's, it's, it's much more focused hardware on throughput than the regular x86 standard sort of um, uh, hardware layout. And, and, and my other question is the other way around. So um, is there any chance that uh, a customer that has a mainframe uh, moves their software onto uh, yeah, a system like this. Yeah, well, maybe it will just surprise you, but there is an extension to VS Code where you can connect to your mainframe and code in VS Code and, and, and synchronize and submit jobs on the mainframe. So, yeah, it, uh, they did evolve on that area. You don't have to constantly use this uh, pretty archaic user interface. There are lots of tools on the outside. Uh, there are things like... Uh, Every organization needs his own design of a report. So there are also report engine design stuff that you do in Windows or whatever. <coughs> Sorry. And um, that you deploy on a mainframe and there you generate and, re and, and, and uh, yeah, print, a re print reports. Yeah. OK. Thanks. Next question. Thanks for the talk. Um, I You're just welcome. wanted to, to let you know if you are an IBM partner, uh, yeah. Then you can have a hard disk, which has the uh, newest ZOS version on it, as a way to develop. Uh, well, yeah, they, they do. Uh, well, they do sell the ZPDT personal yeah. development uh, yeah. uh, tool. Uh, I believe it's about eight thousand euros, uh, and then you don't have a mainframe, but you have a sort of a dedicated big PC. Um, but eight thousand is a little bit out of my uh, budget range, yeah. so. Yeah, but they do um, also supply them to schools and universities where our school or university will say, well, that will give us a chance to train students in, in, in ZOS, which is, of course, the, the current OS of, of, mainframe, of IBM mainframes. Um, and then they'll find a job in, in, in that area, of course. Thanks. You're welcome. Thanks for the question. And uh, just final check, any questions from the internet? No more questions for them. Okay, oh. I th so I think if that's that's it. If there's no more questions, let's thank our, our speaker for an awesome talk. Thank you.